So the, the next talk is uh, Joe Stanley will talk about uh, working with hardware companies and about open hardware. Can you hear me? Is this working? Can you hear me? No? Hello? Mike? Hello? Yeah? Okay, hello, my name's Joel Stanley. I'm an electrical engineering student from Adelaide University at, um, in South Australia. And I'm also an embedded systems hobbyist in my spare time. Um, I'm also talking on behalf of David Rowe. He's an electrical engineer from Adelaide who um, works on uh, telephony and VoIP systems from his home office in Adelaide. And also Edwin Chen, who's the technical sales manager at Com. They're a Chinese uh, hardware company specialised in communications and VoIP. And so I'm going to be talking today about producing your own hardware for use in open source products. Uh, so we'll start off talking about what the problem is, that being commodity hardware. We'll move on to the solution, building your own. And along the way, we'll look at three different case studies. The first being David's uh, free telephony project. Moving on to the LBC XO, something I was involved in as an intern in 2007. And then finally, the Mesh Potato, David's latest project. Um, finally, we'll take a look at the lessons learned by David and, and ATCOM in their work uh, in the Mesh Potato project. So the problem, commodity hardware. Uh, at the moment, free and open source software developers do an excellent job at buying hardware, taking it off the shelf, opening it up reverse engineering it, making it run Linux, and uh, extending the feature set. The problem is they hit these roadblocks. Um, the first roadblock is cost. If others can't afford to buy this product that you've bought off the shelf, then they can't run their f your firmware on it. Um, there's limitations that these products have. They might not have enough RAM. You might need more storage space. Uh, you might need more processing power or, or physical power. Um, there might be the wrong peripherals on there. Or a big one in, in open source is the drivers might be hard to work with. There might be binary blobs that you, are, you can't get the source at, you can't port forward to a newer kernel or whatever. Um, the other problem is dis discontinued hardware. The manufacturer might decide that to change the bill of materials to get a cheaper product out in the market, or they might just stop making the product full stop. Uh, and finally, there's the control aspect. Uh, software can be upgraded, be downgraded, hacked, abused, whereas hardware is not quite as manualable or as forgiving when you, when you abuse it. <laughs> um, so the solution is to build your own hardware. All the value in today's hardware is the software. Um, a handful of different chips make out all the ADSL routers we have. Uh, they're differentiated by their software and the marketing. Um, David said there's over 100 years, 100 man years of development present in the Linux software stack that you're running on a typical router versus just a couple of months for hardware. Um, so the, hard, the software guys should be getting priority. They should be getting the hardware that suits their needs perfectly. They should define and control the hardware development, not the other way around. So our, our first case study is David Rowe. As I said, he's, an op he's a telephony hacker who works in his home office in Adelaide. Uh, he builds on existing open hardware and software that's already out there, um, leveraging the, the force community. Um, he, a couple of years ago, he had a prototype um, PBX, which is a, a device that lets you connect a normal telephone to a VoIP network, or it's a gateway to connect a VoIP telephone to a, uh, a plain old telephone system network. So he had this idea, uh, some rough designs, and he, he just put it out there on his blog. He was contacted by Peter Sun, one of the founding, fan, founding partners of Atcom, and he said, your designs helped our company. We want to make you a prototype of it, um, a prototype of your IP04 PBX. And David didn't think much of this until three weeks later the doorbell rang and there was an assembled prototype sitting in the mail. So a little bit about Atcom. They're a medium-sized hardware product company in Shenzhen in China. Uh, they've been around for about 11 years now. They've shipped over a million telephony ports, which you consider the size of a country like Australia or New Zealand. That's a, a fair chunk of uh, the telephony ports if it was just one country, but this is worldwide, obviously. 
they make a bunch of products, um, VoIP phones, uh, different kinds of routers, IP cards, IDCN products, things like this. Um, one of them's going around right now somewhere. Hopefully we'll get a look at that one. So David's IP04, um, it's an Asterix IPPBX using a little Blackfin DSP CPU. It runs UC Linux, it has a completely open hardware and software design, so you can get the schematics and build your own. You can get the software, hack it, put your own firmware on there. Um, so David, as part of this project, he also produced the open source echo cancelling software uh, that was committed to the kernel a couple of revisions ago, and it, it moved out of the staging directory um, last release or the release before. So that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, this, these open source, uh, so these echo cancelling software is a, a kind of product that takes hundreds of man years to develop, and uh, the companies that own the, the IP on these things, they don't let them out at all. So David uh, published his uh, design up on his blog, and he got people to download the software and, um, and send them back samples of, of the way that his algorithm behaved. And through this kind of open source iterative process, produced this high quality echo cancelling software, which we all now can use in our, in our products because it's in the kernel. Um, and so since then, they've uh, produced thousands of these things. David ships them all over the world. Um, and it's also expanded the product line. You can get an IP01, an IP04, an IP08, just differentiated by the number of ports in the, in the product that you can plug phones into. Um, so it's a really, a really good example of a successful open hardware product uh, that uh, some hacker in a, a small town like Adelaide has produced and sold around the world. Moving on to old PC. It's a bit of a stepping stone between David's fully open product, uh, where you can download the schematics and everything, and proprietary hardware like we all use um, as our laptops. Uh, it has a free firmware and a free operating system, um, but unlike the IPO4, the, uh, oh, sorry, it has a free firmware operating system like the IPO4, uh, and the hardware is designed by the engineers at OLPC to meet their software needs. And by contributing this low-level design, the OLPC guys get to make the XO integrate well with the software uh, and make optimal use of the hardware. Uh, things like fast suspend and the peripherals are very tightly integrated. Things like the screen on the XO, which you've probably all seen. Um, it's a lot easier to integrate that with an open stack than it is with, with something like Windows. Uh, so a bit of an example from the, the latest spring up of the XO, which is going around the 1.5 XO. Uh, they couldn't control the SD card slots during suspend and resume properly. Uh, but because they were the guys designing the hardware, in the next iteration they could just make a change that would enable them to have full control and the product worked without having to uh, carry forward a, a hardware hack for the life of the product, like you would have to with an off-the-shelf product. So our, uh, our third case study is the Mesh Potato. This is David's latest project. Um, Phillieschelco.org, they're a project that aims to provide low-cost alternative to cell phones for developing parts of the world, and they use VoIP and Mesh Wi-Fi technology. Um, the Second device that isn't the XO that's going around, that's a mesh potato, one of the beaters that just came back from the factory on Wednesday. So the goal of the project is to provide telephone access to people that don't currently have it. Uh, the focus is in, in Africa. Uh, it's funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation, the project itself. So they required some custom hardware, a custom hardware platform that's suitable for harsh environments like Africa. Um, and the product's an analog telephony adapter, a bit like the IP04, uh, with a Wi-Fi router integrated. So we could uh, throw a couple of these out into the crowd and um, you guys could start making phone calls together. Uh, David might be doing that in his talk on Friday, so I encourage you to go along to that one. So they teamed up with Atom, Atcom to make this product because uh, they had the previous experience with the IPO one and uh, they're, they're going great guns. Like I said, the, the beat is just off the shelf and hopefully they'll have production units this year. So what are the benefits of open source developers working closely with these hardware companies? Um, the companies in China, they're experts at low cost volume manufacture. It's really hard to do a job from Australia or even from America to, to manufacture this kind of product at the same cost they have. They take away the hassle from you and let you focus on what you're good at, that is writing software. 
they're excellent at, at parts procurement. Like you might say to them, oh, I want to use a, an Arduino microcontroller inside my product, but I go down to Dick Smith's and it costs me $10, it costs me $20, and um, they'll go, oh, don't worry about it, we can get them for a dollar in volume, go ahead, use it. Uh, something that these guys, the Chinese guys, have, have recognized is that force hackers produce great software. Um, and so combine these two, and each takes the hard problems away from the other, freeing everyone to do what they're best at. Atcon themselves, they've said they've found huge amounts of benefit working with the accelerated development process that FOSS gives them. All the software's already there, it already works, they don't have to spend time internal R&D uh, developing the software to make it work with their hardware. And for our side, for the FOSS developer's side, it can uh, provide an income. David is a self-funded hacker. He hacks on these, these open hardware products and supports his family through that work. So there's a huge, huge opportunity here for FOSS hackers because there's this massive disconnect between the business people and the open source development. Uh, one of the ladies who's involved in the, uh, the Village Telco project, she's also part of Freerfunk, uh, a big mesh networking project in um, Germany, and they hack on OpenWRT. They're some of the big OpenRT authors. And they got invited at a, a trade conference to talk to the, the product manager of Europe from Linksys. And this guy says to him, why do we sell so many WRT54Gs? Uh, they had no idea that people were buying it off the shelf, putting their own firmware on it, and using it for their own purposes. Um, reading between the lines, this guy said that they lost about a million, um, that their volume went down by about a million products when they produced the, the, open w, the WRT that couldn't run Linux. And um, as soon as they bought in the Dell version, sales went back up again. Uh, so imagine how good we could, if that's what happens when you accidentally work together with one of these companies, imagine how, how much better we could do if we explicitly work together um, using the power of specifically design, hard, design hardware with our kick -ass software to make a world a better place. Some of the lessons learned. Um, Atcom have this, this new product of devices and Davis gets to sell the, the IPO four line of products in Australia to sustain his hacking, uh, which is to develop more soft FOSS products and the cycle goes around. Um, and the world has a new range of very open hackable, uh, very open hackable hardware software products. Uh, one of the downsides, one of the lessons learned is it wasn't a free ride to producing perfect products. Uh, the IPO four has been a moderate success, but not a runaway success. Um, as it's been designed by a FOSS guy, an engineer, um, it's a bit hard to use by the geeky, the non-geeky users. Uh, the, all the basic products and business principles still apply. Marketing, easy to use interfaces, uh, things like this. Uh, the business is much more than just the product and the technology. It's about the support, the relationships, the marketing. Uh, one of the one of the little things that Atcom, that story they told me when I was preparing this talk is they sold over a thousand IPO4s to a group of people who uh, saw the hardware, they bought it, and uh, took David's software off and used it for doing fax over IP, over high latency satellite links. Uh, this is something that you wouldn't get out of a commercial product uh, that didn't have the designs available and whatnot. And so a bit of a message from the Atcom guys, they want you to produce more open source products using their hardware. Um, if you've got an idea for a product, get in touch with him. Uh, I've got some of their marketing material here. You can have a read of that. And um, yeah, build us some, some fancy new open hardware to, hardware to hack on and use. Thank you. Any questions? Anything you'd like to me to cover in a bit more detail? So, with, with the case of the uh, the IP4, for example, um, sounds like the the hardware design was actually done by David. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so he did the schematic. Atcom did the layout. And, okay. and source the, the bomb. So, so is that fairly typical that that uh, 
you know, the, the actual design of the hardware is is handled by the, you know, the developer of, of a project like this? Is that a uh, good model? It's, it's pretty unique. David's probably one of the, the first guys in the world that's doing something like this. Um, lots of it's based on the reference design, so it's got a, an Athros chipset inside, and so it's the same kind of design you'd get from a commercial router, just with the the extra bits bolted on the side, the, the Asterix um, hardware. But uh, I'm kind of here as a proxy of sorts for David because he couldn't make it today. Uh, so come on Friday and, and ask him all your questions. Can you um, elaborate a bit more about the mesh potato? Uh, so the mesh potato, it's um, 8 to 11. It's currently got an external antenna. We were testing a PCB antenna from between my balcony and the end of a jetty in Adelaide the other day, and that worked great. So it's going to have an internal antenna now. Uh, it's running a Blackfin CPU, so it's a little bit embedded DSP type uh, CPU with asterisks on it. Um, same kind of asterisks you'll run on your, your X86 machine at home. So if you know, know asterisks now, you know asterisks on the, the mesh potato. One of the things they're aiming for is uh, really easy to use interfaces. They want this kind of product to be able to be uh, picked up by an entrepreneur somewhere in Africa. He'll sell a couple of hundred to his community and then he'll provide um, service and support for these guys. So it has to be easy to use, easy to install. Currently they've got a, a, a bit of a point and click web GUI that goes with it and um, to get a network going you have to change two fields. They'd like it to work out of the box so you, you can just power it up and then make a phone call. If you want to come over to the Arduino mini conf later, I've got two units there you can have a play with that make calls. Yeah, oh, sorry, that's what I didn't cover. It's using Batman uh, to do the, the mesh routing. Um, yeah. So yeah, we did this test with the, the microstrip antenna. It's 18 centimeter PCB microstrip antenna. And it went uh, 375 meters from my balcony to the end of the jetty. No worries, I could hear David crystal clear, uh, which is, I mean, I'm an electro engineering student. I've done RF engineering, but it's still amazing that something this big can talk that far. Um, on the IPO4, um, I noticed that I think ATCOM might be doing either a different distribution or a, or a slightly um, tweaked ins distribution to David's. Is, is it likely that you'll you'll have those people take over development of the of the software as well, or or how how does that normally work? Um, that's a good question for David. I know that he's been doing some work recently with making his firmware much more point and click. Uh, it's something he realises he hasn't put enough energy into, and um, he'd like to be out of that, a bit more out of the box, a bit like Atcom software. You're right, that is a different firmware that they put on the ones they sell. Um, but it's still not very too easy to use their firmware. I had a go with it the other day. Uh, so I think David thinks he can do a better job and, and hopefully we'll see something soon. I found in, uh, in the past with my job that uh, really scary problems arose when we started to get hundreds and thousands of uh, devices uh, out working working to get together. Um, uh, uh, to what extent do you think the mesh potato is going to scale? How many devices do you think you can uh, get working? That's a good question. Uh, the, the lady from Freefunk uh, would probably better answer that much better because they've been running their, their citywide mesh network for a while. Um, I'm, I'm relatively new to the project. I've been only been playing with the betas for a few weeks now. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, the way I understood it, it wouldn't scale past it more than a couple of hundred because it would be going to, to fairly remote village type areas where there wouldn't be that many houses. But I could be wrong. That's a good question for David on Friday. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Oh. Have you seen interest beyond just this one company that's willing to do these things with working with open designs? Have you seen other interests? I mean, you talked about the Linksys thing with doing the, the WRTGL, you know, coming back and, and, and that. Is, is, is there anything more than that little... Uh, it seems I'm, to be the only example I've seen of... I'm sure there's other companies. I mean, there's old PC. I've been working yeah. with, with the guys who make three cores of the laptops in the world mm. um, with Quanta kind of thing. So, um, 
yeah, I'm sure there's other companies. China's such a big place that there has to be probably hundreds more doing this similar thing. Um, this is one that David's come across and had a good experience with. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you.